present the momento to speakers of the session to Dr. Amit Singh, Dr. Bhaswati Pandit, and Dr. Dheeraj Kumar, please. Dr. Bhaswati Pandit. To Dr. Dheeraj Kumar. Thank you, sir. Now we are going to start the next invited talk session of microbiology and molecular biology. The chair of the session will be Professor Tom Blender. Welcome once again, sir, and we are honored to have you here. Words are very short to describe Sir Blendrill. Now the speakers for this uh, session are Dr. Lauren Kramer from CNRS France and Dr. Yasuhiko Matsumoto from University of Tokyo. Well, let me as chair welcome our first speaker. We only have two speakers in this session instead of three, but I ask everybody to keep to time. And we're welcoming back on the stage uh, Laurent Kramer, and um, he's going to talk about his research and uh, on the mycolic acid transporter MMPL3 and on uh, drug targets in Mycobacterium obsessus, if I've got it right. All yours, Don. Thank you very much for this presentation. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to, to participate to the meeting. Um, I'm very glad to be back in India. It's always a pleasure to be here. And I would like uh, especially thank uh, Sam Raj for organizing everything and for the hospitality. So, um, I'm, I'm going to tell you more about Mycobacterium abscessus and we'll try with, try with a, start with a brief overview. Also, uh, this has been briefly mentioned this morning by Sir Tom Blundell in his talk. So, Mycobacterium abscessus is a rapid growing species described first in 1953 from a knee infection by Frerichs and Moon, in contrast to M. tuberculosis, which is a slow grower. So abscessus is a, a rapid growing species. The, the abscessus complex uh, possesses three different subspecies, Mycobacterium abscessus sensus stricto, Mycobacterium boleti, Mycobacterium massiviense, and all can induce a wide spectrum of clinical infections. These infections can be um, Uh, can be extra pulmonary infections as illustrated here, so cutaneous infections or disseminated infections or pulmonary infections uh, in patients with already uh, um, underlying lung disorders. And this is a case of COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, as you can see on this uh, uh, um, pulmonary uh, histopathology section. Uh, the presence of aggregates of hemapsis here along the inner wall of the lung cavity. And here you can see the acid fire staining, which is the same than M. tuberculosis. But abscesses can also uh, infect 
other kind of patients, uh, which are the cystic fibrosis patients. So cystic fibrosis is an autosomal recessive disease that affects these proteins, CFTR, which is the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conduct uh, uh, conductance regulator. So basically, this membrane protein acts as a chloride channel. And when this protein is mutated, this, uh, um, this leads to uh, the presence of a very thick mucus here in the lungs, as shown here by this white material. And this very thick mucus, mucus uh, cannot be easily cleared from the lungs. And this leads to chronic polymicrobial infections, primarily uh, with uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but also Staphylococcus aureus. But uh, one can find also NTMs, non-tuberculosis mycobacterium. Essentially, Mycobacterium avium, uh, slow growers, and Mycobacterium abscessus in roughly 10% of the CF patients. But the presence of M. abscessus is really deleterious in these CF patients because it's associated to a rapid and, uh, and severe decline of the pulmonary functions. And the other thing is the presence of abscessus is often a contra, contra indi, um, indication of uh, a lung transplantation, and lung transplantation is often the last hope of CF patients. So M. abscessus is extremely difficult to treat and to eradicate. It is probably the most uh, drug-resistant mycobacterial species, resistant to nearly all, if not all, TB drugs. So these are the four drugs that are used in the clinics. Uh, claritromycin, which is a micronite, amikacin, but also beta-lactams, such as cefloxetine, imipen. And the problem is that some of the uh, infected patients can respond to this treatment, but many of them do not respond for treatment. And it's often very difficult for the clinician to predict the outcome of the treatment. So this generates a high rate of therapeutic failure. So it might not be particularly interesting to understand the intrinsic resistance of M. abscessus to uh, most of these uh, anti-TB drugs. But you also try to identify new chemical entities that are active against mycobacterium abscessus and try to understand how they are working and what's the therapeutic target in the mycobacterium. And this is the second part uh, which I'm going to develop now. So what we started to do quite recently is uh, the hypothesis was to um, uh, avoid de novo screening of drugs against mycobacterium abscessus because it's time consuming and it's also very expensive. So the hypothesis was to use already existing data that were previously uh, um, uh, obtained during MTB uh, screening programs. So uh, we get access to the GSK library of TB compounds and we screen this library against my whole bacteria for M. abscessus. And among the 177 compounds that are all very active against TB, only one was found to be very active against mycobacterium abscessus. The structure is shown here, where it contains a piperidinol backbone, and hence the name of PIPD1. So here is listed the MICs of PIPD1 against a wide panel of uh, M. abscessus clinical isolates from CF origin or non-CF origins. So you can see these, the MIC is very low, 0.12 micrograms per ml much lower than the MICs of claritromycin, cefoxetine, amikacin, imipenem. This graph shows you that it has also a serial activity, at least in vitro, the, the treated bacteria versus the untreated ones. And uh, PIPD1 was also efficient in killing the intracellular bacteria, as shown here, with an efficacy which was uh, increased as compared to imipenem. So the next question to, for us was to analyze or investigate whether this compound was also effective in, 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 a, in an infected animal. The problem is you cannot use immunocompetent mice to study the infection with abscesses. Bulb C mice just clear the infection after three, four weeks, either after aerosol or intravenous infection. So this is why we try to develop a new model of infection and we develop the zebrafish model of infection. And well, these are basically the kind of results you can obtain in zebrafish. So when we infect the, the embryos with uh, the rough morphotype of M. abscessus, you can see there's a rapid killing of the embryos, roughly 70% or 80% of killing in eight days. This is the untreated control and treated with PIPD1, so there's an increase in uh, the survival of uh, the, the treated embryos. So it's important to mention here that we use a low concentration of PD1, three micrograms per ml, and we don't inject drugs. 
if the embryo is too small. So we just add the molecule in the water where the, the, the fish are, are swimming and, and developing. Um, the other thing you can do with this model is to measure the bacterial load. So here you can see in green there was a reduction in the bacterial loads in the infected fish, treated fish, as compared to the untreated ones. So basically there are three populations up here, though so they are still highly infected. Because you can see abscesses here expresses the TD tomato uh, fluorescent marker. Some of the fish that are uh, moderately infected and some animals that have completely cured, cured the infections. And with the nice the advantage of this system, it's because of its optical transparency. You can really image in real time the effect of a drug in vivo and see by following us, uh, the animal over the days how it reduces the size of the infection cluster. And this could be correlated also with a decrease in the number of, of abscesses in the treated and animals as compared to the untreated ones. So altogether, this shows that PD-1 is active in vitro, in macrophages, and in the infected zebrafish model. How does it work? So uh, we generated 23 spontaneous resistant mutants in the lab. And uh, we found, uh, by whole genome sequencing of these of this mutants, we found that all of them, 100% of the resistors, contained a SNP in the same gene, which is MAP4508. This is a phylogenetic tree that shows that MAP4508 is highly related to these two genes here, which are known as MMPL3 in Mycobacterium smegmatis and Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So what are MMPLs? MMPLs uh, MMPL stands for Mycobacterium Membrane Protein Large. And these have been largely investigated in M. tuberculosis. And six of the 30 MMPLs described in M. tuberculosis have been shown as important lipid transporters. So for instance, MMPL3 transport the mycolates in the form of trialose mycolates through the membrane. MMPL5, the sulfur lipids, and the diacetrialose. MMPL7, the thiocerolid microcerosides. And some of the MMPLs can also, through their efflux pump activity, participate in drug resistance mechanism. This is the over the conserved organization of the MMPL transporters, 12 transmembrane domains, two or three cytoplasmic domains. And this uh, slide is listing the number of MMPLs from the different species. Slow growers, fast growers. And as you can see, there are large heterogeneous distributions in the numbers of MMPLs, with very uh, low numbers for M. leprae tuberculosis, and much higher numbers for rapid growing species, 27 MMPLs for Mycobacterium abscessus, here shown here in red. And because Mycobacterium abscessus is a main variable mycobacteria, we think that this high abundance in MMPLs could participate or, 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 or to the adaptation of MMPLs uh, to its the, the Lauren, to, uh, could you speak a little bit louder? It's uh, rather difficult, I'm told, at the back. Uh, it, it, it's too low? It's not audible. It, Hold your mic up. Oh, closer. Yeah, OK. And, and could I ask the people at the back to stop talking? It's really quite difficult to listen. So uh, a high number of MMPLs in, in, in the microbiome abscessus cluster, which could explain uh, uh, its uh, adaptations to adaptations to variant, uh, various um, environmental niches or lifestyles. So what is MMPL3 doing? MMPL3, as I mentioned, it is transporting trialose monomycolates, whose structure is shown here, through the plasmic membrane. And, what, and, and which is then taken up by the antigen 85, which is a microlate transferase that converts TMM into trialose demycolate, shown here, and also through arabinogalactan to produce mycolylated arabinogalactan. So um, to prove this, what we did, we labeled m cultures with C14 acetate. Uh, um, uh, and in the presence of increasing concentrations of PD-1. And then you can see here there is no effect in the biosynthesis, the novo biosynthesis of mycolic acids, alpha-alpha prime. Mycolic acids are very long-chain fatty acids. 
However, when you analyze the apolar lipid fraction on this uh, thin layer chromatography, you can see a dose dependent reduction of the three TDMs here and here, and a concomitant accumulation of three arose monomycolate. And in addition to that, we could see a dose dependent inhibition of arabinogalactan bound mycolic acid, really suggesting that uh, indeed PD1 is probably blocking the activity of MMPA3 as shown here. So these are the different mutations we have mapped into uh, the, 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 two, uh, the two dimensional structure of MMPL3. Most of them are mapping the transmembrane domain. And what is interesting, just last month, a paper came out in Cell where the group has uh, crystallized for the first time MMPA3 from Ems magmatis. And you can see here the transmembrane domains, the expressive air loops and they were able to dock PD1 in these structures, as shown in so supporting the data and, sh and, and, and confirming that there is a, a physical interactions between PD1 and the transporter. So um, in parallel of these studies, we were conducting other work. We wanted to analyze and um, try to understand how the smooth to rough switch is occurring. So I should have mentioned that m exists exist into two forms, the smooth variant and the rough variant. The smooth is recognized as the initial airway colonizer. Then a genetic switch can occur in the lungs. And this leads to a rough morphotype that is much more aggressive and invasive. So is this smooth, uh, smooth to rough switch involving MMPL transporters? So one observation that one of my postdoc did uh, two or three years ago was quite interesting. She was working on the smooth mycobacterium boletti. And suddenly she found one clone that, was, that started to be smooth and then uh, became uh, rough, as shown here. So one, one part is smooth, the other is rough. So we, we took these two pieces of the colony, did whole genome sequencing, and find a single SNP here in a gene called MMPL4A, which is present in the cluster of synthesis and transport of these glycopeptidolipids, the GPLs. So this is the parental smooth strain that produces the GPLs, and this is our rough strain, this one, which has lost the capacity to uh, produce these GPLs. So in, in indicating that this tyrosine residue is extremely important for the activity of the GPLs. This is just a, a, a schema that shows that GPLs are produced in the cytoplasm and transported uh, through the action of MMPL4A and MMPL4B. This is multi-sequence uh, element of all the MMPLs for M tuberculosis, and you can see that our tyrosine residue is concerned in all MMPLs, and next to it, an ASP residue. And this ASP tyrosine residue in TM10 was also found in TM4. And because they are concerned in all the MMPLs, uh, we hypothesize that they are playing a critical role in the transport. So, uh, just to uh, confirm that, we use a genetic, uh, um, uh, we confirmed this genetically, so we took the advantage of using an MMPL3 conditional mutant in, M in M smegmatis. So MMPL3 is the only uh, essential MMPL in smegmatis and tuberculosis. So this conditional mutant can grow in the absence of acetamide, but not in, uh, in but not in the absence. Uh, so it can grow in the presence of acetamide, but not in the absence of acetamide, unless you complement it with a wild type MMPL3. However, when you complement it with the uh, MMPA3 alleles that are mutated in these uh, uh, tyrosine or aspartame residues here and here in TM4 and 10, there is no growth. Clearly indicating that these residues are extremely important uh, for the activity, probably because they are drying the protomotive force of the transporter, which is important to energize the system. And interesting in the paper that, that came out last month on the crystal structure of MMPA3, the authors have highlighted the presence of, the, of these two tyrosine ASP pairs that are bridged together by hydrogen bonding. And PD1 is present in the vicinity of these two uh, helices, so probably disrupting the protomotive force that leads to the arrest of mycolic acid transport and uh, killing the bacteria. So uh, just to summarize this part of my talk, we have used a uh, 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 no, an already existing TB library to identify a new compound very active against abscesses and, and, and show that it's active against clinical isolates and inhibiting MMPA3. And this prompted us to, um, uh, to, um, uh, to 
to screen for other MMPA3 inhibitors. Uh, so we started to collaborate with Alan Kozikowski in Chicago. We have shown a few years ago with Bill Bouchard that the handle 2 carboxamines are extremely active against TB by inhibiting MMPA3. So here we sh you show that the handle 2 carboxamide are also very active against hemapsesis. It's a seedal effect in vitro. Here you can see in infected macrophages. Uh, that it's um, uh, in the presence of, of the other two carboxamides, there is now a reduction in the number of bacteria. The bacteria appear here in purple in the untreated ones. This is the quantification showing a nice effect in reducing the bacterial loads in the macrophages. And here are the MICs of the other two carboxamide, 0.12 micrograms per ml, um, similar to PIPD1 against hemapsis clinical isolates, Massiliente clinical isolates, Boletti clinical isolates. Rough, smooth variant CF patient, from CF patients, non CF patients. And um, again, to uh, prove that it was these compounds were active by targeting an MPA3, we generated, we generated a spontaneous resistant mutant that contains an alanine 309P mutations in MPA3. As expected, there was a high upshift of the MIC against our two compounds, but also cross resistance to PIPD1, suggesting that they are acting, acting uh, uh, the same way. Uh, this is just gen genetic validation showing that when we overexpress the mutated MMPA3 allele in the hemapsesis, there was a nice uh, resistance level in the presence of increasing concentration of the compounds as compared to the, uh, the parental strain. Right, just, um, just uh, some biochemical evidence showing then again there is a reduction if TDM production, accumulation of 2 arose monomycolate and dose dependent inhibition of microelated arabinogacan as shown previously for PD1. And nothing like this happened in the presence of the resistant strain that contains the a 309 p allele in MMPA3. So um, some work was done here at the Seram University by Sam Raj, who has done all the, the ADNI studies. Uh, he has shown that these compounds have very good ADNI properties. And just would like to finish by showing the co-crystallization of MMPA3 with NITB349. Uh, uh, and the authors have shown that these adult 2 carboxamide, which is very close to other compounds, fits in the same binding pocket that PIPD1. So presumably also by acting by altering the photon molten force that inhibits the mycolic acid transport. Uh, just to sum up, so we have now uh, two different chemical entities that are completely different from a chemical point of view. In fact, we have another one in the lab that are active against extracellular abscesses, smooth graph, but also in the bacilli uh, that are residing in the macrophages by targeting MMPA3. So we have shown that MMPLs are involved in cell wall elaboration environments. Uh, this is the case of MMPL 4 AB, but also some other MMPLs. And one can see MMPLs here as uh, an, an, a janus faced uh, uh, nature proteins. On the one side, that can be used as sites of vulnerability, which is the, exemplified by MMPL3. And on the other side, we have shown in the lab that uh, they are involved also um, in drug resistance in mycobacterium abscesses, especially uh, against tyrosetazone analogs, but also against bedactin and clofazinin by introducing mutations in the theta regulator that control the expression of the MMPLs. I'd like to thank the different people who have participated to this work, people from my lab, especially Christian Dupont, Albertus Folnion, and my colleague in, colleagues in Versailles, Jean-Louis Hermann, Vincent Lemoyne, and my colleagues in Lille, Jan Gardel, Christophe Biot, Faustin Dubar, the group of Alan Kozikowski at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and Sam Raj Tribib Chera here at, at Sony Park, India. And thank you for your attention. Well, th thank you very much for a very exciting story. Um, do we have any questions? Maybe I could just ask, uh, is this particular target, uh, is it found in other mycobacteria? Um, could we use it elsewhere? The MMP, so you can find other MMPLs in actinobacteria. 
but MMP3 is only present in those that produce mycolic acids. So essentially, uh, essentially my mycobacteria and some corine bacteria, but not in the other bacteria. That's why it's really specific. We have uh, um, a screen TD on, on a large panel of different bacteria, gr uh, gram negative bacteria, gram positive. It's not active at all. It's really specific. Okay. Uh, Anyone else? Ah, uh, oh yes, down the front here. Um, uh, was a good talk, thank you. Um, um, I just wanted to clarify uh, about the proton relay, the mechanism where the aspartate tyrosine um, participate in the enzyme uh, catalytic reaction. Um, um, could you uh, throw some light yes. on uh, that, Well, we, we don't know much about, but we know they're involved in the proton relay. But there are many other residues that are involved in proton relay, but so far they, so far they have not been um, uh, identified. Um, this is also based on the crystal structure of effluxpans, uh, for instance, from Pseudomonas or E. coli, from which the residues involved in proton relay have been identified. So by analogy uh, of the structures, uh, these residues could be identified. Well, if there's Thank no one else, I think we'll move along to the next speaker. Thank you very much for keeping time and very interesting story. <laughs> and our next speaker is uh, Yasuhiko Matsumoto from uh, Tokyo, from Tokyo uh, University. And um, I, I couldn't find a title for you. Uh, and um, so you'll, uh, I, we, ha yeah, so we don't have a title yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, I did track you down on the, um, uh, on the, to the, the Tokyo uh, websites. Uh -huh. And you did a PhD in the pharmaceutical sciences in the University of Tokyo. Yes. And um, uh, you, you, I know you've published quite a lot on silkworms, <laughs> yes. so I'm wondering what all that is about. <laughs> and um, have we got you set up yet? No, just one minute. And so as I didn't get an abstract, tell, tell me a little bit more about yourself before you start. <laughs> I don't know, I, I submit my uh, abstract, but so. <laughs> okay. Okay, here. Uh, ah, yes. Uh, ego, Master Kudasai. <laughs> so, Chairman, so thank you very much for your kind introduction. So, uh, so also, so thank, thank you very much for giving me a chance to talk about uh, my study in this great conference. So, my presentation title is, so, New Approach for Drug Discoveries by Using Silk Worms. So at first, I'd like to introduce, introduce uh, uh, Staphylococcus aureus. So Staphylococcus aureus is an opportunist human pathogen, and uh, Staphylococcus aureus also causes various diseases such as septic arthritis, meningitis, and sepsis. And Staphylococcus aureus secretes various toxins such as hemorrhaging and protease and so on. However, so in infection mechanism of Staphylococcus aureus are still unknown. So our group participated uh, genome project of uh, uh, genome project of uh, Staphylococcus aureus and published a paper. And uh, so we found that uh, molecular functions of 597 genes in Staphylococcus aureus are not yet unknown. So then we 
thought that uh, it is possible that uh, 597 unknown genes may include novel appearance genes. So that we construct the strategy to understand the infection mechanism of Staphylococcus aureus. So first step is we construct the mutants of the uh, 597 unknown genes. So second, uh, we perform the screening, the mutants that show the low uh, animal killing ability. So the third step, we analyze the molecular function of the identified virulence genes. So at first, we perform the uh, generation of the mutants by gene-targeting mutants, so then we succeed the mu so many, many mutants, so there's no problem of the first step. However, in second step, so, so we face the problem that because we need to uh, prepare the animals for evaluation of virulence of the mutants. So in generally, so almost the researchers use uh, uh, mammalian animals such as mice. So Staphylococcus aureus injection lead to the uh, death of mice. Uh, for, uh, on the other hand, the gene disrupted mutants of the Staphylococcus aureus uh, do not lead the uh, uh, mouse uh, death of the mice. If so, that this uh, gene is required for the virulence of the Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, however, so if we use uh, mammalian animals such as mice and rats, uh, cause the problems such as high cost, uh, expensive, and uh, animal welfare uh, in terms of the uh, escal problem. So then it is difficult to perform the screening using large number of animals. So then we focused the silkworm is an invertebrate animal. This slide shows the benefits of the silkworm model. So silkworm has many, many merits, uh, low cost and small space to layer, and low escal problem compared to the mammalian animals, and easy to inject and collect of silkworm blood. So then we thought that uh, it is possible that the silkworm may be used for in vivo screening. So then at first we tried to establish a silkworm infection model. So, so we inject the uh, Staphylococcus aureus to the silkworm. The silkworm uh, clearly uh, death uh, infected by the Staphylococcus aureus. On the other hand, saline injection did not show the death of silkworms. So this result suggests that Staphylococcus aureus has silicon killing ability. So then in second step, so we added the uh, screening step by using the silicon infection model. Then next we uh, pa uh, confirm the uh, uh, virulence of the identified genes to the mouse killing or not. So third step, we analyze the molecular function of the identified virulence genes by genetic study and biochemical analysis. So then we screen the mutant that uh, mutant uh, shows a decreased virulence against the silicon or not. So then the, we identify the three genes and we name the uh, CVFA, CVFB, CVFC were identified using silicon infection model. This is a figure, so y-axis shows the survival of silkworm, x-axis shows the time after infection. White, white sac indicates the wild type strain injected silkworm, and the closed sac indicates the CVFB mutant injected silkworm. So this result suggests that CVFA mutant is less uh, virulence to, compared to the uh, wild type, and CBFB and CBFC also shows a uh, uh, virulent phenotype. So this result suggests that so CBFA, B, C genes are required for the silicon killing ability of Staphylococcus aureus. And next, we confirm that this uh, gene is required for the mouse uh, to toxicity or not. So 
in this presentation, I focus the CWFB. So the CWFB gene mutant show the decrease in accumulation of mouse spleen. The, the method is here. So uh, we injected the uh, Staphylococcus bacteria wild and CWFB mutant to the mice and uh, uh, isolation of the spleen and count the viable cell number. So I actually show the uh, colony forming unit of the Staphylococcus aureus in my spleen. So CWFB mutant shows a decrease the colony forming unit of the uh, colony forming unit compared with the wild type. This uh, they suggest that CWFB gene is also required for the virulence against mice. And further, we analyze the effect of the toxin production. So then the, the CWFB mutant shows a decrease in hemolysis production. So this uh, white area indicates the hemolysis activity. So CWFB mutant shows the uh, low hemolysis production. So this uh, data suggests that the CWFB gene is uh, required for the hemorrhaging production of Staphylococcus aureus. Further, so we analyze the CWFB mutant that characterizes the uh, molecular system of the infection of the uh, Staphylococcus aureus via CWFB gene dependency. And uh, so we revealed that CWFB gene is required for the uh, hemorrhaging protease and DNA, so that these are the exotoxins. And these exotoxin production were regulated by the AGR, is a famous uh, uh, gene regulator of the Staphylococcus aureus. And the CBFB regulates the gene expression of the AGR and, uh, and uh, regulates uh, this uh, hemorrhaging production and uh, independent and independent manner. However, so molecular function of CVFB protein is still unknown. So then we reveal the structure of CVFB protein. So, so we found that CVFB protein have the three RNA binding domain and uh, one winged helix nucleic acid binding domain. So then we thought that the CVFB is a RNA binding domain. So then I tested that the CVFB have the RNA binding activity or not. Uh, y axis shows the so bound of the poly U is a artificial RNA, and the CVFB shows the clearly have the poly U bind activity. So then the CVFB has a RNA binding activity. So, brief summary. So, novel virulence genes were identified using a silicon infection model. The silicon CVFB mutant showed a decrease in hemorrhaging production. And CVFB protein has RNA binding domains revealed by analysis of the crystal structure. Also, CVFB has a RNA binding activity, then the CVFB protein is RNA, novel RNA binding protein. So then we found that so silicon infection model are useful for identification of novel valence factors of pathogens. Based on, based on the experience, so we try to develop a novel antibiotics using silicon in vivo screening system. Generally, so in drug uh, discovery, at first, uh, researchers screen the active compound in, in vitro and second, test the therapeutic effect in vivo. However, almost all uh, active compound don't have a therapeutic effect in vivo because of the uh, pharma pharmacokinetics of the toxicity of the compound. So then we thought that uh, can we perform the in vivo drug screening using uh, animal model? So then at first I checked that the so silicon is useful for the 
uh, evaluation of the antibiotics or not. Injection of Staphylococcus aureus causes a silicone death. However, so further injection of the chrom is an uh, antibiotics shows uh, therapeutic activity. Again, so silicon has uh, many, many benefits for performing the in vivo drug, in vivo screening. And uh, we also uh, reveal the pharmacokinetics of drugs in silicones. So absorption and distribution, metabolism, distribution, toxicity are met. So these researches suggest that the uh, pharmacokinetic parameters of the drugs are similar range between silicones and mice. So then we construct the strategy to identify uh, antibiotics. So first is pre we prepare the uh, culture supernatural sample from soil bacteria library. So second is uh, screening the samples that have uh, uh, therapeutic activity. So then we perform at first the, so using the silicon infection model and the identified uh, chemicals will uh, check again using the mice infection model. Third, so puri purification and uh, I, I determination of the structure and the active compound from the uh, culture samples. So then we screen the uh, effective chemical using the silicone infection model with uh, Staphylococcus aureus at first. Uh, Staphylococcus aureus injection uh, leads to silicone death. On the other hand, a sample injection shows uh, therapeutic activity. And uh, we uh, s uh, succeeded the uh, identification of the lysine E from the uh, soil bacteria using this system. So then this result suggests that the silicone infection model is used for identification of novel antibiotics. So, this in, so in this presentation, so I'd like to uh, talk about the so Aspergillus fumigata study. So Aspergillus fumigata, a type of environmental filamentous fungus caused uh, opportunistic infections so Aspergillus fumigatus injection leads to the silicone death, and also we screen the uh, culture sample, and two samples show the therapeutic activity. So then we uh, purified and determined the structure and succeed to identify the ASP2397 from the soil bacteria sample. So then the silicon infection model is also used for identification of novel antifungal drugs. Here is the structure of the ASP2397 was identified as an antifungal drug by in vivo screening using silicon infected with Aspergillus fumigatus. And this chemical is effective to mass infection, also effective to the mass infection model with Aspergillus fumigatus. And this chemical was listed in the uh, website, Aspergillosis and Asper, uh, Aspergillus and Aspergillosis website, and uh, so discovery of uh, antifungal agent ASP2397 using a silicon model of Aspergillus fumigatus infection. So this uh, chemical was purchased by the Baikal is a, a company name, and so then change the names of VL2397, uh, has com uh, completed the dosing in a phase one clinical trial. So then this chemical now enter to the uh, phase two clinical trial. So then the, so, so probably so this uh, chemical is a uh, candidate, good candidate, of the antifungal drugs for treatment of the invasive aspergillosis. So conclusion, uh, the silicone infection models are used for identification of novel virulence gene, novel virulence factor of pathogens. And silicone infection models are used for identification of antibiotics, in, including antibacterial drugs and antifungal drugs. 
These results uh, suggest that silkworm is a beneficial animal for in vivo screening. So then we established a, a, a system and uh, identified the many, many uh, uh, chemicals and uh, using the, for evaluation of the antibacterial drugs, antifungal drugs, and uh, antiviral drugs. So acknowledgement, the, the, they are my collaborators. He is my boss, Kazusa Sekimizu, and so structural analysis of the CVFB was collaborated with uh, so Dr. Kim Pinshu, Dr. Ashley Dekon, Dr. Ian Wilson. They are belong to the Scripps Research Institute. Additionally, uh, I'd like to introduce about my study, uh, another study. So, so I want to develop the uh, novel anti-diabetic drugs using silicone in vivo screening system. So then, the, so, so high sugar diet feeding causes uh, hyperglycemia, hyperlipidemia, in insulin resistance, increase in fasting glucose level in blood, and uh, decrease glucose tolerance in silicones. Um, so then injection of the anti-diabetic drugs increase insulin or uh, a human insulin or uh, metaholamine or yeah, pioglitazone, some like uh, anti-diabetic drugs, show the so therapeutic activity. So now I screen the uh, chemicals that inhibit the uh, diabetes onset. So then recently I uh, screened and I succeeded to identify the chemicals as, a, as anti-diabetic drugs. So this data also suggests that the uh, silicone is a uh, very good animal for in vivo screening. Thank you very much. So to move share the cops at this. Does anyone have any questions? Um, it seems fascinating you can uh, do diabetes in a silkworm. <laughs> 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 but but uh, fantastic. A anyone with a down to earth question? <laughs> yes, please. Yeah. Please. Congratulations for your uh, interesting presentation. Mm -hmm. I just want to ask that uh, how you selected those three genes uh, for Staphylococcus aureus, CBF, A, B, and C? So, uh, at first, we screened the mutants by using the silicon infection model. So then, the, so we uh, constructed the 300 mutants and screened the mutants that show the uh, abilurate phenotype against the silkworm infection. So then uh, we clearly, uh, uh, these three mutants clearly show that the uh, uh, abilurate phenotype. So then we uh, uh, identify the three genes. Okay, okay thank you. A anyone else? Anyway, okay, well, we should uh, congratulate you on developing all the way from the model <laughs> to some very, very interesting applications. Uh, I think it's really brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, do, do we have... Um, uh, so, so we need to honor our speakers Yes. with a memento. So may I please welcome Dr. Lauren Kramer. present you with this and congratulate you. I've got it the wrong way around, but you can read it. <laughs> so, well, well done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and Dr. Yas Yasuhiko Matsumoto. Very good. 
<laughs> so, uh, as I understand the program, we're going to have uh, tea now. Uh, Sam, it, it, we're having a tea break now. No, no, no tea break. Oh. <laughs> I, I, I see. It says it in the program. So, so uh, I, I'm going to pass over the last session to Sam because he should be listed as chair. Uh, and um, I'm only going to do 10 minutes of it, am I not? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the tea break will be after the well degree function. I want all of you, please, come to the center so that it will, yeah, please, both the side. So we will be starting it, you know, continuously. We will have the well degree function. Then after that, there will be a high tea. And there is an important announcement regarding the certificates. All the speakers, please collect it from the registration desk. Hello. Sachin. Sachin. Hello. Hello, 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 hello. Hello. 